Dear friends, you could be forgiven for coming to church week after week and thinking that somehow the gospel is made up of all these stories that we somehow pull out of some place. We tell them that the clergy figure out something clever to say about them, and then they go away again, and maybe we hear them again three years later. It can, it can feel very episodic. I think it's important for us to know that the writers of each of the gospels were very clear they were trying to tell one coherent story. And so we do a little bit of disservice to them by picking things out wherever we happen to pick them out to read each week, or we, the, the church, not we, this, this particular congregation. We read the same ones that everyone else does. We do them a bit of a disservice by choosing these things that don't necessarily tell the story in the sequence that I'm about to sneeze. And now I'm not going to. Thank you very much, nonetheless. We pull these things out, we don't necessarily see the coherent story that they intended to tell, much less the story that the, the entire Bible, the entire history of Christianity is intended to be telling us. There's something in the whole story that's important, and it's useful once in a while, I think, to step back and look at the bigger story. Now I have a useful opportunity to do that, an unusual one. I mean, normally, I don't get to preach four Sundays in a row. It occurred to me that if I can take these four Sundays, I might be able to talk to you about some of the ways that we see the presence of God coming out in these stories. Luckily, it's four very different stories that would otherwise would seem completely unconnected. And yet, I think if we will take that as our frame, as our focus, where is the presence of God in this story? There's some really interesting things to be learned. And so for today, we have this story about the storm at sea, but to get into it, the way I got into it at least was to go back and read it a couple of times and see what the phrases were that stuck out to me, as they do in what's called African Bible study. You read it through and hear what God is saying to you just in the words that day. And there are a few of those that I think are useful as a way into this story. <clears throat> the first is right at the beginning, on that day, well, what day? What's going on? You need to know that what happened before this story was that Jesus was collecting a crowd. People had come to hear him speak and to be healed and do everything else that he did. And there were so many of them that he was unable to speak to them in a way that they could hear. So his disciples had put him in a boat and sent him, however far out into the water, 15, 20, 30 feet. So then he would be far enough away that he could, everybody could see him. And I guess maybe his voice would carry over the water, whatever the deal was. But for our purposes, the key thing to see is he's been sitting in a boat all day. You wouldn't think that his logical next thing would be to say, well, let's get in a boat and go somewhere. And I don't know about you, but when I've sat in a boat all day and have been rocking and rocking, I want to be on someplace solid as quickly as I can after it. But that's not what happens. Jesus says to them, let's go to the other side. Jesus initiates it. He might have had some idea of what happens in boats on lakes at night, but certainly his followers would have. They don't seem to have pushed back too much. Maybe there was a slight bit of against our better judgment in the back of their minds, but for some reason, Jesus initiates it and leads his followers into the scene that we see. The next one is just as he was. It says that they, they took him into the boat just as he was. Now, I'm sure that 2,000 years ago, they were not thinking seriously about life preservers or oil slick clothing, whatever it is you wear when you go out to collect lobsters in Maine, whatever they wear on, on boats where there's going to be bad weather. I'm sure they weren't thinking of any of that stuff. But if the writer of the story felt it was important enough to put it in there, then presumably somebody was making some kind of preparation. And again, since his followers were people who, many of them, whom were used to being on the water, maybe they were, in fact, doing something to get ready for this trip that Jesus was not. There's something in that about going into these things in whatever state we find ourselves in, I think. Then, once the story begins, we hear there were other boats with him. We often like to imagine that we are the only boat. And yet we know there are other boats. And in this case, the other boats are there not because 
they thought it would be a good idea to go out on the water in the middle of the night, but because Jesus is there, they're following Him. Whether it's for a pure motive, like wanting to hear what He says and to have a deeper understanding of God, or maybe a slightly less pure motive, like, well, He seems to produce food and healing wherever He goes, and so I'll follow Him, doesn't really matter. Something about the charisma of Jesus has pulled people off the shore out into the water with Him, and now there are all these other boats. And then finally, the storm hits, and the best his followers can think to do is to get angry that he's asleep and say, don't you even care this is happening to us? And so that moment, I think that we find where we are this week, at least, for what the presence of God is about. I think it's about the presence of God in crisis and in chaos. Normally, we would, as 21st century nice suburban people, imagine that God is to be found in stillness and tranquility, in moments of calm when we can hear the voice. I've said all these things to you. I'm only making fun of myself. Maybe, if we're really lucky, we can also feel the presence of God when everything is really clicking. We're, we're, we're doing some big project. It's really well organized. Everything is falling into place. Everything is working where we don't usually expect to find God is when we can't figure out what to do next, when we are so anxious, so worried, so fearful that nothing seems to be going right and we can't imagine how anything good is going to come out of wherever we find ourselves. That is a completely different place than where we typically find ourselves sitting calmly on Sunday morning and yet it is often where we find ourselves in our lives, isn't it? So it is worth stopping and looking at this scene for a minute and asking ourselves, well, where is the presence of God in this scene? I want to break all the usual homiletical rules and tell you what the punchline is before I even get anywhere near the end, just for those who are keeping track of the time. The key, I think, to see is that God is in the same boat with us. God is right there. And then to try to imagine what it means that God is in the same boat with us. One piece I need to circle back to before I get too deeply into that, though, is to point out that there were those other boats. There are those other people who are out there. We often do think, as I said, that we are the only boat. And we are the only ones who have this problem. And yet, a God's eye view of the world would tell us otherwise. We at St. Thomas's have been doing something that a lot of churches have to do nowadays uh, that's a little icky and yet really important. That is looking at what we would do if there were a crisis here, if there were an emergency, if there were a hurricane or an earthquake or a flood or civil unrest or something were to happen that was, was dangerous, what would we do? So the vestry and the leadership of the church ask a little committee to think about these things. And again, to tell a story on ourselves, when we began this, we began thinking, what would we, St. Thomas's, do if this happened to us? And so it was really useful that about the first thing the committee did was come back to us and say, well, you know you're in a community, right? And if there's a hurricane, it's not just going to happen at the corner of Park and South College. Lots and lots of people are going to be affected. We have to think about them too. There's something about the God's eye view that tells us a crisis is never quite as local as we imagine that it is. With that in mind, we should ask ourselves who we are in the boat. What, is, what, what good is faith anyway in the middle of a crisis? Is there any sort of faith we can have in the middle of a crisis? I think it's fair to say that competence is about the first thing that deserts us. About the first thing we forget how to do is anything that we know how to do when suddenly we're in an emergency. That's one reason why we're doing this planning in advance thing. So we have a list of things that we can follow. Step one, step two, step three. Things that we would know if we were not otherwise stressed, but that we're never going to remember in the moment. Competence is gone. I want to suggest to you that the sort of calm, rational assessment is also gone. The idea that, well, on balance, things usually work out overall, sort of things that we do when we're looking at the, the, the long term. 
in the moment, all we care about is the moment. We don't really care whether this is going to work out six months from now, whether in general most churches will survive even if ours burns down. That is not a helpful way to imagine what our faith is supposed to be. And I don't think it's useful to fall back on a sort of childish Sunday school faith. This Jesus loves me, this I know either. It doesn't really get us much further particularly in a situation like the one that we see in the story today where there would at least have been some expectation that the other people in the boat with Jesus had some experience of this and would have had some idea what to do. I think all we have to fall back on is God is in the boat with us. God is there before the emergency ever starts, although God may be asleep on the cushion in the back of the boat stern for those who know these things. God is there. That, I think, ought to be something that brings us a certain amount of calm, even as we contemplate emergencies that perhaps have not even happened yet. God was there first. God is always there first. Once we get into it, though, the next major problem is that we tend to lose our nerve partway through, don't we? Again, the people with Jesus probably had a reasonable understanding of what the risk was of what they were doing, but they didn't pr try to prevent him. They didn't say, no, we're not going to do that. That's not a good idea. They, st they set out because they were reasonably skilled. They knew what they were getting into. And it seems like the trip started reasonably well. It was only once they got out into the middle someplace that all heaven broke loose. And the sea was crashing and the wind was blowing and everything was chaotic. Now, bear in mind, it's not like this was all that far they had to go anyway. I had to look this up this week. The Sea of Galilee at its widest point is only eight miles wide. So you can always see one side from the other. You can always see where the goal is that you're trying to reach. It's not as if... You have to take it completely on faith that there's going to be land out there in front of you someplace. You can see it. And yet, they lost their nerve, just as we do in similar situations. I know I've spoken to you before about the way that we are exploring changes in campus ministry and the way that we deliver campus ministry to students and staff and faculty and the community and everybody around the University of Delaware and elsewhere in the state. And so for a couple of years now, we and a couple of other denominations have been talking about doing this in a cooperative way, probably moving it out of any church proper into some other place, because it seems that young people are less and less willing to walk through the red doors. And for two years, we've had really exciting discussions about this. There's been energy behind it. We have these, these discussions at 8 o'clock the, in the morning on some weekday, which is not especially early for me, but is early for some of the other people who are on the call. And always they are energized by the end. That we, we can't stop talking. But in the last six months, we have finally come down to, okay, here are our, 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 our energizing ideas. Now we need, we need a memorandum of, agree, of agreement. We need to know how we're going to do this. We need policies and procedures. We need to figure out funding. We have to hire people. We have to find a space. All those practical things. And in the calls, I could see the fear starting to come into people's eyes. Well, what do you mean? We've been talking about this, but do we know how to do it? What, what, what comes next? What if we fail? What if it doesn't work? Do we have the skills to do this? Do we have the, 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 the whatever it takes? It's only by continuing to remind ourselves what it is that we set out to do and the fact that we can see the goal already there. It's not like it's so far away that we can't even imagine it. That we've been able to sustain that energy and to feel it continue to flow even as we do exciting tasks like wordsmithing the memorandum of agreement. You have no idea what happens once you get enough attorneys involved in any project. something about recognizing that energy that has always been there, that, that, that wind that has been blowing us up to this point. Keep that in mind, dear friends. These, these people in the story were not rowing across the Sea of Galilee. They were relying on the wind to push them there. It had gotten them that far. 
did anybody else notice in the story that what happens after Jesus does all of his stilling is a dead calm? I'm thinking, how are they going to get the boat the rest of the way? This is a little bit overkill as far as fixing the problem, it seems. In any case, they, eventually they made it somehow. We always have to be feeling that wind behind us, that wind in our sails. It is pushing us along. Be confident that, in fact, that spirit that has enlivened us never, never, never deserts us. And it's at that point that we come to the problematic part of the story. The disciples have their moment of panic. They wake Jesus up, say, don't you even care? And Jesus acts. It seems almost offhand, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, shut up, go away. And the wind and the sea stop. I'm reminded of the story that was also in the reading from Acts in the past week, where Paul and one of his companions are walking through one of the cities, Troas, one of them, and there's a, a young woman who has a, a possessed by an evil spirit who's coming along behind them, proclaiming loudly who they are. And eventually, Paul is just irritated enough. He says, just go away, and the spirit leaves her immediately. There's something about that suddenness that is a good reminder to us of how powerful the action of God can be. My fear is that it causes us to overlook the times when that action of God is just as real, but is perhaps not quite as dramatic. Back again to campus ministry, we have been um, talking about all this time about how we're going to do these things and how much money we're going to need to raise to run this thing, particularly in a sustainability sense, this year, next year, the year after, and so on. And so it's been more difficult to imagine that there might be little things along the way that give us a little bit of gas in the tank. Uh, a week, two weeks ago now, uh, a, a member of the diocesan staff thought it would be a good idea if I discussed this project with a committee of the diocese that normally has nothing in particular to do with campus ministry, but she felt that they should know about it, so I did. And it turned out that a member of that committee is prominent in another church that has an endowment fund that it uses to make small grants for projects like this. And as I was walking out, this person cornered me and said, when you get to that stage, come to us and ask for money and we will give you some. You know, it's not going to be like the lottery. The money's not going to fall from the sky. But that we would scorn to ignore the blessing of God when it comes in the form of a few thousand dollars rather than a few million dollars says a lot about our faith, does it not? I can assure you we will take him up on that offer. As the hymn says, we have come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his word. He's never failed us yet can't turn back. We've come this far by faith. That, dear friends, is the first way I think that we feel the presence of God. I have three more weeks to keep this going, but for today, that's probably enough. Eight o'clock told me they're going to go make t-shirts that says, God is in the boat with us. Maybe that should be our, our motto for this week. Whatever it is, I might alter it a little. God was in the boat first. Whatever boat it may be, wherever we may find ourselves, however chaotic the situation may be, God is with us. God is there. Let that be our, our song for the week, our comfort, our hope, and our consolation. Amen.